I'm Andrew Marks, it's my brother Nathaniel. We're just two guys, born and raised in USA, and we're woodworkers. You know, what really put us on the map was the chair. The chair, it was the chair. And I went in with a plan, maybe to use a cedar, something classic. And I see the mahogany and it calls out to me and says, how about me today? I grab that mahogany, start building. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough. Right, so it's, ex just, it's very, it's an expensive wood. It wasn't practical. Yeah. I do most of the hammering because he's got a bad shoulder. I heard it, I was rest it was a wrestling injury. We work great together. I often think of a plan, Andrew Mark. Anything involved in the shoulder, he can't touch, but man, we couldn't do this without him. I mean that, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. This, it wouldn't be Andrew Mark and Nathaniel's woodworking shop without Nathaniel. I mean, it's interesting now that we've been doing this a while and it's been 15 years and I've never picked up a hammer. He I haven't. Never. He's never. Everything we do is artisan. Is it art, artisan? Artisanal? Artesian? Our attention to detail is is higher than average. So a lot of people have been using the reclaimed lumber, mm -hmm. barn doors. What hasn't been done is uh, barn nails, reclaimed nails. It's a lot of work to pull them out. But yep. We believe it's worth it for the finished product. What stands out about the chair is that everything is working together. The legs, all four of them, they come up to create, connect with, and create the seat. And that's an invitation to people to just come and be. I remember we stepped back, looked at the chair. There's nothing quite like it when you see uh, months of hard work. And hey, we understand that this chair, it started potentially 100 years ago when that, right. when that birch started growing. We acknowledge that. When you get the chair from Andrew, Mark, and Nathaniel, you're getting so much more than just the chair. So much more. It's safety, uh, which is, comes in a close second to craftsmanship, which we know means artistic, scientific. If you go ahead and just follow us at, at Andrew Mark Nathaniel Woodworking on Instagram. You're gonna find pictures of our trade, but you're also gonna find heart. Mm -hmm. we're just, we're two guys making a difference in this huge world, one nail at a time. Best thing I've ever made. I wrote a song. I built this like foldable stool and it doesn't wobble or anything. Probably like a lamp and I made it out of pipes. This is so nerdy. Um, like the, I feel like the best thing I've ever made are spreadsheets online. The worst thing? The worst thing? Well, I'm horrible at drawing. I made a really, really, really disgusting looking clock when I was in woodshop class in grade eight, and I never want to see it again. I've also burnt macaroni and cheese. <laughs> I made a really horrendous batch of cookies when I was like in the third grade, and I added in lard when I wasn't supposed to, and I took it to school, and nobody could tell me that they were awful. Everybody, I just kept selling them in the bake sale. It was terrible. Nobody bought those cookies. Yeah. It sounds gross. They were disgusting. Yeah. If Christianity had a logo, I think we'd all agree that it'd be the cross. All over the world we see crosses, on signs, in architecture, jewelry, fashion, and tattoos. The cross was a tool used in the first century to execute criminals. But today, it's a symbol pointing to Jesus. Typically, people who are famous are remembered for the great things they did during their life. But Jesus seems to be equally remembered for his death. Yeah, but why does Jesus' death on a cross matter to us today? 
Paul wrote in the New Testament that the Son of God, talking about Jesus, he loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus died because he loves you. That's the reason for the cross. It's God's amazing love for you and for me. Now, Jesus died for us. What does that mean? Like, why did he have to die? What was the problem? Well, there's something absolutely amazing about every human being. You and I were created by God. That means that you're not an accident. And every person is made in the image of God, in the image of the Creator. So humans have a unique capacity for all kinds of love and goodness and creativity. But there's another side to the coin. People are also capable of doing wrong. You only have to look at the news for a moment to see humanity's capacity for evil. And we can't just say, well, those are evil people and these are the good people, because it's far more complex than that. The Bible uses a specific word to describe this part of humanity, sin. Now, I know the word sin isn't necessarily one that people love. It can often be misunderstood. I've heard it used to describe really good foods like chocolate or cake. Okay, I'm not, I don't think we're feeling the sinfully delicious part. It's not the right tag. Right. It's got a bad connotation. Yep. I'm thinking something more like, for goodness sake, I love this cake. Hello. I like it. Well, the one you did before. Bam, bam, it's cake in the pan, chocolate cake, cake. But sin in the Bible isn't described in a positive way. It's used to describe the bad stuff in our life. We're not talking about accidental mistakes like eating too much chocolate or something like that. We're talking about our natural inclination towards selfishness, to act in a way that goes against what's best for the relationships that we care about and even our own well-being. Paul wrote, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means that sin isn't just an issue for a few people. It's something inside each one of us. I know I've done stuff in my life that I deeply regret. I've hurt people, even people I love. Yeah, and I think that if we were all honest, we've all done stuff that's wrong. We've sinned. And none of us wants to be called a sinner. And if you're like me, you might think, okay, I'm not perfect. I know I get stuff wrong, but compared to some people, I'm not that bad. Yeah, but the problem with that type of comparing is that it's not how Christianity teaches about sin. God doesn't share our rating system. He doesn't compare us to one another to see if we're sinners or not. Compared to God's standard for goodness, we're nowhere close. We're all sinners. We're all in the same position. We're people in need of forgiveness. So if we're all sinners, why does it matter? If we're all in the same situation, what's the problem? The problem is there are consequences for our sin. Okay, so then what are the consequences of sin? Well, the first consequence is pollution. Just as the pollution of our environment is a problem, Jesus actually said it's possible to pollute your life. Now, sin pollutes our hearts. It poisons our relationship with one another, and it poisons our relationship with God. And second, sin is powerful. It has an addictive quality to it. It can destroy our lives. Jesus said everyone who sins is a slave to sin. So for example, if you were to take heroin for a sustained period, you'll become addicted. But it's not just hard drugs. It's also possible to be addicted to things like envy, greed, and even arrogance. And sin is a penalty. You know, there's something in all of us that cries out for justice when we hear about the terrible things that are done to people. You know, things like robbery or violence, slavery, abuse. We want the people who do these things to be caught and punished well, because we believe there should be a penalty for those things. But it's not just other people's sins that deserve to be punished. It's actually ours as well. And lastly, the worst part of sin is the impact it can have on a relationship with God. Sin causes a partition. It creates a gap between us and God. And that's an issue because we were created for relationships with people and with God. But sin fractures that relationship. Maybe you've experienced how a lie can wreck a friendship or even how cheating can break apart a family. In a similar way, sin actually builds up a wall between us and God that you and I can't tear down by ourselves. Romans 6.23 describes the penalty of sin as death. When we are disconnected from God, our ultimate source of life, that's spiritual death. Um, it's 
everywhere. I mean, it's unavoidable. Some people may say drinking and smoking, I don't see that as sin. Cheating on a loved one or lying to loved ones, I think that's, that's kind of a sin, I guess. Terrorism and the war and all of that, that for me is a big part of sin. War and uh, the mistreatment of you know, women and children. Personally, I try to like not think about it. Greed. I see everyone greedy. I, I see everyone mostly think about their selves for, first. There's things that you, you, should, you shouldn't do, you know, like, like, like rape and uh, slavery. Disrespect to older people and people hitting girls, guys hitting girls. That's one of the things I don't like. Anytime like bad things happen to like good people or to like innocent people. There's evil in the world because there's evil inside of us. So if we could figure that out, that would be perfect. There would be no evil at all. The cross shows us that God loves this world, that He loves you. And it shows us that He's done something about the problem of sin. He didn't ignore the problem or say, you know what, it's not that bad, don't worry about it. No, God came to earth in the person of His Son, Jesus, to deal with it personally. Jesus' death on the cross is God's solution to the problem of sin. One of Jesus' closest friends called Peter put it like this. He said, he himself, talking about Jesus, bore our sins in his body. By his wounds, you've been healed. In other words, because Jesus was wounded, we can be healed. He took the consequences of our sin on himself. It's been described as the self-substitution of God. God substituted himself for you. Jesus died in your place. On the 31st of July, 1941, Sirens rang out from cell block 14 in Auschwitz concentration camp because a prisoner had escaped. As punishment, the prison guards selected 10 random men to die in a starvation bunker. The ninth man selected was a man called Francis Gajewniczek. And when he was chosen, he cried out, my wife, my children, I'll never see them again. At that moment, another man stepped forward and offered to die in his place. And to everyone's amazement, his offer was accepted. That man was a Catholic priest named Maximilian Kolbe. And he was taken with the other nine to the starvation bunker. 15 days later, they were still alive. So on that day, August 14th, 1941, they were killed by lethal injection. 41 years later, on the 10th of October, 1982, the death of Maximilian Kolbe was put in its proper perspective. In St. Peter's Square, Rome, in front of a crowd of 150,000 people, Pope John Paul II described Maximilian Kolbe's death in these terms. He said, it was a victory, like that one by our Lord Jesus Christ. Being executed on a cross was the height of pain. Yet the New Testament doesn't focus on the physical suffering of Jesus too much, but instead it focuses on his spiritual suffering as he carried the weight of our sin. I heard it explained like this. Let this hand represent you and me your life and my life. And let this book represent the things that we do wrong, the sin that causes a barrier between us and God. Now let this hand represent Jesus. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. He lived a sinless life, so there's no barrier between him and his heavenly Father. There's a verse in the Old Testament that prophesies the death of Jesus, and it says, We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And then it says, The Lord has laid on him on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. On the cross, Jesus was carrying your sin and my sin. So do you see where that leaves us? Free to have a relationship with God. The results of the cross are amazing. The cross and resurrection are really like one event. And it's like a beautiful diamond. It has different facets. Or I like to see it like a beautiful onion because of the different layers of meaning. A beautiful onion? Yeah. Like yeah, the no, we're talking about something beautiful. Onions aren't beautiful. Diamonds are beautiful. People love diamonds. People love onions, Ben. I don't... Oh. We're trying to describe yeah, all different... the different angles and perspectives and layers to the cross. I just thought right. onion, diamond, they both capture Are you okay if we just... Like facets, though, I think? I'm totally... Oh, if you... I mean, just as long yeah, as we're yeah. agreed that they're okay, equal good. quality 
analogies. Onion, diamond, same diff to me. OK. Well, we'll so I'll, I'll go diamond then. Sure. All right. Yeah. I feel good about that. OK. When a diamond hits the light a certain way, you see it one way. And when it hits the light another way, you see another part of its beauty. When we think of all that Jesus has done on the cross, it reveals so much. First, it reveals how much God loves you and how precious you are to him. You never have to feel insignificant or worthless because the cross reminds us just how valuable we are to God. And the cross speaks to suffering too. It shows us that God isn't far away, sitting on a cloud somewhere and watching all the suffering down here. No, through Jesus, he came into our world to suffer for us and now he suffers alongside us. The cross also tells us that the powers of evil have been defeated, and the resurrection tells us that the story ultimately ends well. Because of the cross, the penalty of sin has been paid. Our guilt has been removed. The debt that we owed was paid for us. There once were two little boys who were best friends. They played together, went to school together, they even went to university together. They were inseparable. Until their careers took them in very different directions. One became a lawyer, the other a criminal. As one was promoted to a judge, the other disappeared deeper and deeper into a life of crime. Eventually, the criminal was caught and sent to trial. On the fateful day in the courtroom, he came face to face with his old best friend, the judge. And so, the judge had a dilemma. He loved his friend, but he had to do justice. And so, he fined him the appropriate penalty for the offence. It was a huge fine. There was no way he could ever afford to pay what he owed. But then, the judge took off his robes went down, stood with his friend, and wrote out a cheque covering the cost. He paid the penalty himself. What Jesus has done for us is even more amazing than what the judge did for his friend. The debt was way bigger. It was our debt of sin. And the love that he demonstrated was far greater because it cost him his life. And the result, even better. It's total forgiveness made available to you and to me. Forgiveness. Uh, Basically accepting one another for everything, flaws and all. I guess letting bygones be bygones, you know? When you're willing to uh, let something go when someone made a mistake in the past. Forgiveness is a second chance. It's a second chance. Or third or fourth. It's really just getting past what, in, what, what issue you guys had, you know, whether it be between you and somebody else or you and yourself, because a lot of people are tough on themselves and it's hard to forgive, but it's, it's totally letting go and, you know, moving forward. I'm not religious, but I feel like God's forgiveness is a way for people to let go of their wrongdoings or forgive themselves and move on with life. It means love and sacrifice. Complete freedom. Refreshment and new life. It is someone stepping on your white trainers and you can say, I'm sorry. And then the person says, don't worry, you're forgiven. That is forgiveness. The reality of the cross has the power to change us. It helps us leave behind bad habits and experience new freedom in our lives. Before I was a Christian, I used to have so many negative thoughts about myself that I'd run through my mind. As a result, I felt insecure, I pushed people away, and ultimately I was unhappy. But when I began a relationship with Jesus, so many of those thoughts, they disappeared. The power they had in my life was broken. And in a similar way, when my friend Chris encountered Jesus, his addiction to drugs was instantly broken. He was set free. Now here's the thing, it's not always like this. Change is a journey, it's long term. Some things might change overnight, but a lot of the change we're talking about happens over time. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, if he sets you free, you will be free. That means that we can experience freedom from the grip of sin and see transformation in our lives. The power of sin has been broken. 
and the pollution of sin has been cleansed. John writes that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. When I realized that I'd been forgiven by God, it helped me to forgive others too. All of us have been hurt at some point in our lives, and that hurt stays with us, often leaving us bitter or even angry. But when we experience God's forgiveness, it makes it possible for us to let go of that anger and bitterness and to forgive others. In 2 Corinthians, it says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. The cross wasn't God punishing an innocent third party. God himself came to die for you and for me. Ultimately, because of the cross, we have been reconciled to God. The partition of sin has been removed. Jesus told a story about a prodigal son. The son leaves home, breaking his relationship with his father. After wasting the family money, he finds himself with nothing, alone, empty, and convinced that he had wrecked his relationship with his dad forever. Reaching the point of desperation, the son decides to return home with a small hope that he might be able to earn a wage working for his father's business. As he's coming home and is still a long way off, the father sees his son. And instead of waiting for his son to come to him, the father goes out to meet his boy, stretching out his arms, welcoming him home with a huge hug, fully accepted as his son. And this story is for you. No matter what you've done, when you come home, when you come to God, He runs to you and He embraces you. God loves you. Jesus died for you. And through the cross, we're invited to have a relationship with God. And when I understood all of this, when I experienced this, it totally transformed my life. And it can totally transform yours too.